Yu-Gi-Oh! has always combined the serious and the silly, no matter which generation of the game you're from. For every giant dragon or space robot, there's a goofy little guy out there. One of the things Yu-Gi-Oh! loves to do for a generally goofy idea is making food into monsters. They either like making food scary or adding a little happy face to them. It's pretty polarized. So for this video, we want to analyze the weirdest food monsters that Yu-Gi-Oh! has brought us over the years. I feel like calling these food monsters weird is an oxymoron, but regardless, we'll find the designs that we both love and make us question what's going on with Yu-Gi-Oh! They can be any type of food, meat, veggies, sugar, etc. And joining me for this culinary masterpiece are my co-hosts, Judgment Meter. Oh, that's making me really hungry. Somebody please feed me. Give me the food. And Negative X. Well, I'm kind of an expert on this topic because you see, I've been eating food for like 30 years. So I know a thing or two. Now, let's prepare the top 10 weirdest Yu-Gi-Oh! food monsters. Number 10, Doom Donuts. When flipped, Doom Donuts destroys all face-up monsters on the field whose original attack attack or defense is zero. But those monsters were weak enough. Why do you need help? And on a flip effect where it takes twice as long to finish them off instead of just using a card that destroys them on activation. Uh, maybe you really needed help with the Shiranui matchup? Or you needed a way to get you bell momentum before Fire Kings existed? Obviously, this was meant to help players who were having trouble getting around some of those beat stick or wall monsters that were all attack or defense with nothing in the other stat, or those monsters that could alter their stats and were indestructible by battle, but the flip effect combined with this monster being released in the Zexal era when we had ample options to out monsters like those, made it a laughably weak card. I was kind of expecting this to be released in one of the GX sets. Doom Donut's design follows the occasional visual gag that Yu-Gi-Oh likes to do where a monster or effect related to Zero is in the shape of a circle, and it's also clever that its frosting appears to be under it, as if it was physically flipped over to go with its flip effect. It seems like a very niche card. Like, you're never gonna be throwing this, but man, I hate the way this looks. Why is it dripping from its sides? Is that maple syrup? Who puts maple syrup on donuts? On the topic of its appearance, Doom Donuts begins our look at how Yu-Gi-Oh tries to make food fearsome by adding sharp teeth to them. If the hole in this donut is supposed to be its mouth, how does it close it? You're not supposed to have teeth on the sides of your mouth. Do they all just come together at once to close? I I really hate its mouth too. You know, generally when there's a mouth, it's so it can get nutrients of some sort, but this is just passing through. Maybe it's a filter feeder. He's just floating in the glaze machine, filter feeding, yum, yum, yum. And he's real angry about it, because what kind of life is that? Left to be a barnacle in the tank of glaze. Even if someone tried to trick me into attempting to eat this donut by telling me it was normal, well, first I wouldn't believe you, but if I did, I would be too freaked out by the teeth in the middle. Those look like they would have a horrible crunchy texture that I would never want to chew on. Also, I think my hands would get too sticky from that sopping wet frosting. Too messy for my taste. I'm not gonna lie, I, I'd eat this guy. Wanna know how I'd do it? For each one of these cards, I'm gonna tell you how I'd eat this guy. This one, it's all about being careful. You know where the dangerous part is? The mouth. You just nibble from the sides. Nom 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 nom. And you throw out the mouth. Bam! Easy peasy. Take that, Doom Donuts. Your Doom was being so easy to eat. I don't want a Doom Donut. I want a regular donut. You know, the one with white vanilla glaze and with the rainbow sprinkles. Not the chocolate kind because I can't eat chocolate, it gives me migraines. Not this one with teeth because that's owie. So does that mean chocolate could technically hurt you more than a donut with teeth? Teeth doesn't have anything to do with my migraines. Number 9, Naturia Fruit Fly. The Naturia archetype is charming. They've never been good by themselves, but a few of their cards are splashable with other decks, and their extra deck monsters are phenomenal, so it's a trade-off for their main deck monsters leaving a lot to be desired. Their archetype exists in some sort of enchanted forester garden, so you have plenty of bugs and vegetation here, with a few other odds and ends mixed in, and they all have these whimsical faces. A majority of their plant life is food, so there's plenty of fruits and veggies in this garden, and that begs the question, what's the best crop of food you can pull in the Nacheria garden? The beans, bamboo shoots, and cherries all look like they're having a good time hanging out with their friends. Oh my god, Nacheria cherries? They look too happy. They make me uncomfortable. It looks like one's telling the other a secret about me. Who told you about that? Who told you? It's a lie. Stop laughing. Moving on. Nature, your pumpkin is also having a good time. It 
Is he high right now? I like that the eggplant is this weird bug creature, but when I just looked at him quickly, I thought he was a normal eggplant chilling in the middle of the forest. But if I had to go with my favorite Naturia food monster from a design standpoint, I'd say it's the fruit fly, since I like his creativity and the pun name. He's a fly made of fruit, and each major section is a different type of fruit. The abdomen is a strawberry, the thorax is a blackberry, and the head is a grape. Oh my god, does he have little mint? leaves for wings oh god i'm just gonna put it out there what i'm doing with this guy i'm muddling him i'm throwing him in a glass i'm gonna crush him up with a little bit of gin maybe a lime bam tonic water that's all you need delicious i'll eat this fruit fly every day i'll leave grapes into my trash every day for this guy yum yum it's a delicious cocktail all ready to go this guy deserves a reward for being a fruit fly that i actually like i hate all real life fruit flies since you can't eat fruit in the summer without them getting everywhere no matter where you're eating it. Fruit Fly's effect is average, lowering your opponent's attack and defense by 300 for each Naturia monster you control, and then you can take control of one of their monsters once you've lowered their defense to zero. But that would really require you to have a field full of Naturia monsters to truly be effective, which could be difficult to attain. Well, if you can't make good use of its effects, you can at least enjoy the artwork. Number 8, Jerry Beans Man. Jerry Beans Man should be the most beloved Yu-Gi-Oh monster. Look at him! Even if you don't love him, how could you hate this man? He's got the forehead of victory! He's so confident in himself despite only having that tiny little sword. And he's got a name! He's Jerry! His Japanese name is just supposed to be Jelly Beans Man, so a bit less exciting, but still, he's He's a jelly bean man. There's a whole jelly bean theming here. His feet and hands are jelly beans, yet he can still grip his weapon somehow. And he's in front of a wind of jelly beans. So do jelly beans just have many forms in this universe, or are those the limbs of his fallen brethren behind him? Despite being called a jelly bean man, his main body appears to be a mung bean, the favorite bean of Uncle from Jackie Chan Adventures. I'd eat his hands and feet separate because each one looks like it's a different flavor of jelly bean. But you know, he'd be a challenge because it looks like he'd stab me. Although he's got zero defense, so I guess he's got a glass jaw. Maybe we should call it a sugar jaw. <laughs> Jerry's card lore also refers to him as a bean soldier. So does that mean that he's related to the monster bean soldier? Is that guy one of the generic bean soldiers while Jerry is an elite? We see on the card Mame Make that Jerry hangs out with bean soldier and Naturia beans. So even if they're not related, the beans in Yu-Gi-Oh stick together. The other interpretation of Jerry's lore could be that perhaps Perhaps Jerry is trying to join the ranks of Bean Soldier. Jerry's lore states that he believes that he himself is the strongest warrior in the world, but his true abilities are still untested, so we have no confirmation about anything on him. I'm not sure they're untested. He's got a defense of zero. I think there had to be a test for that. He's full and ready for war. If you underestimate him, it will be the last thing you do. He's puffed up his cheeks and he's ready to fight. He's ready to throw down. He's ready to throw down a face. Down. Though we see Jerry's abilities eventually being tested on other cards, like where he's about ready to face off against Swordsman of Landstar, he gets rotated with Marshmallow, and he joins the Scrum Force with a Silo Hero, Thunder Kid, and Luis the Beaver Warrior who isn't actually a beaver. So perhaps now Jerry's abilities have fully been tested to show his soldier prowess. That being said, he's pictured with monsters that are all weaker than him in terms of attack value, so maybe they're not the best test for his skills. I like how the Yu-Gi-Oh wiki also points out that Jerry has a shield, yet his defense points are zero, which means that may be the world's most ineffectual shield. It's because those jelly bean gloves have no grip. His attack makes up for his low defense though, being the highest of any normal level 3 monster, so he can take pride in that. He came out in the early GX era when that could have some form of relevance, but he did premiere in the same set as Cyber Dragon, so that goes to show his bad timing. Jerry just needed to be released a few years earlier, maybe around the time Sonic Duck was released instead. Then we'd be talking. Jerry would have dominated if he existed in those old Gravity Bind decks. Number 7, Ghost Beef, Mild Turkey, and Hollow Hollow. These three are a series of cards where they're normal pendulum monsters, with a pendulum effect where you roll a die and it changes their pendulum scale based on the result. These are clearly just novelty cards, but they look so fun. If you 
couldn't tell they were related because of their effects, you can with their theming. They're based on the holidays from the end of the year, with Hollow Hollow obviously being Halloween, Ghost Beef being Christmas, and Mild Turkey possibly being Thanksgiving, but he could also just possibly be another facet of the Christmas meal. I don't know, its lore doesn't even reference a holiday like the other two monsters did. It just makes a bowling reference to make him a pun on the bowling term turkey, who is bowling in the artwork. These cards go all out for entertainment value, though they are kind of morbid when you break them down. This is a cooked turkey that's come to life. Was he a good bowler before he was cooked? Should he technically be considered a zombie? This is close to a plotline of a Courage the Cowardly Dog episode. I guess the turkey's probably going like, well, I'm sorry for having hobbies before you ate me. So yeah, fair enough. Fair enough, turkey. Who am I to judge? Some people love bowling. Ghost Beef is also not classified as a zombie, but she's more of a middle ground between cooked and not, because she's a cow serving roast beef from herself. I've heard of fresh, but this is ridiculous. Does the lore of the ghost of Christmas dinner imply that she's haunting us, or this is just a fun spirit visiting us for the holiday season? Either way, best pun. He's really mad because you ate him on Christmas, and you left the leftovers on the table. You didn't finish him up. He's mad you wasted. That's not cool. Well, luckily for me, I ate turkey this Christmas, so mm-hmm, I'm safe. <laughs> oh my god, it's thanks killing all over again. And finally, there's Hallow Hallow, who I thought would be the least morbid of the bunch, but the limerick on his lore points out that his noggin is hollow from carving him out into a jack-o'-lantern. And now I'm like, oh, we gutted this poor creature and now he tries to steal candy on Halloween to seek his vengeance. Hallow, hallow, brain of tallow. Guts are gone, noggin's hollow. Seeking sweets and marshing mallows. Watch your back and your candy sack. Who's a baby? This guy's real cute. Look at his hat. Look at those lifeless eyes. I'd put a candle in that head for him. Don't you have to eat it like everything else on this list? But this one would pain me to do it. I'd take off his little hat and say, I'm sorry, little one. And then, I don't know, jam. Turn him into a nice pumpkin jam. By extension, the other jack-o'-lantern monsters would also be good foods, but Hallow Hallow looks like the most edible of them all. Also, this dude's a pendulum tuner. That's pretty rare. Not as rare as this delicious slab of ghost beef, though. Number six, in Mato and Cherry in Mato, or is it pronounced in Mato? You like in Mato, I like in Mato. Well, let's just get on with the entry. In Mato is a pretty standard card. He has a draw two effect if you tribute him when the opponent targets one of your other plant monsters with a spell or trap effect. It's a somewhat specific scenario and effect, but I get what they were trying to do. But forget about the effect. We're all in on this design. He's a tomato. Mato, who's a prisoner inmate. That look on his face tells me a story. I can't tell if he regrets what he once did and is now reflecting, or if he's been framed and is now thinking about his revenge. How dangerous is this guy? They hooked him up with that ball and chain, and why is he phasing through the bars? Is he a ghost tomato? I like this card. It makes me sad, though. Oh, this is so Mayu and the Soul Piper's mischievous little soul. Oh, God. He's being dragged into the depths of hell. To expand upon his mystery, he has a related card, Cherry in Mato, who summons two in Mato after Cherry is destroyed by battle and sent to the graveyard. It's also a tuner for some reason. What's the deal with these guys? Are they friends with the Inmato in prison? Are they escaping or trying to help their friend escape? Or are they rejoicing because the big Inmato is locked up while they can roam free in the jail? Cherry and Mato was always weird to me since they were recruiters specifically for a monster that was wasn't very good. Though, their attack and defense was half of Inmato, so that was cute. Wait, so he's just staring at the other two be free? This is getting darker by the moment. Why is he in this cage and the other two are dancing? Is he about to be ritually sacrificed? They are sad their friend is in jail. They are praying for his release. How would you eat these guys? I mean, I guess in a salad? I don't even know what these guys, they don't look that tough, but man, clearly they are. It makes you wonder if this duo of cards was going to be part of a bigger archetype that was ultimately scrapped, maybe like a salad prison, the coleslaw shank redemption. I don't know, that was the best Shawshank vegetable pun I could think of. Though Yu-Gi-Oh just had somewhat of a fixation on tomatoes in general. You have these guys, Intercept Tomato, a certain mystical one that may be later on 
on this list, and that tomato farmer from the Zexel anime whose cards were never printed in real life. The funny thing was, that farmer never used either of the Inmatos in his deck, but his tomato-based spell cards had them on the artwork. I don't know why they couldn't just throw an Inmato in his deck while they were at it, but that's the extent of their anime appearances. Actually, Cherry and Mato was on a spell card in Arc 5 after that, and regular and Mato appeared on a random Performer Pal spell in the Arc 5 anime too, where he seems to have regained his freedom. Wait, is he pretending to be Ojama Red in this picture? Because here you have Ojama Yellow and Black, but instead of Green, it's Green Dust on filling in for him, so it's almost like you have the B team in for the Ojama Force that's out sick. Who'd fill in for Ojama Blue? Koitsu? Number 5, Hungry Burger. We previously discussed Hungry Burger on my Weird Ritual Monsters list, so I'm not sure how much more there is to say about a non-effect ritual monster from the initial wave of ritual support. However, Hungry Burger is the most iconic Yu-Gi-Oh fast food, so he had to be on this list. So let's have a second helping of Hungry Burger. As random of a card this seems to be, it may actually be a reference to the manga. There was a chapter where Mokuba had a Russian roulette of food, where there was either a prize or poison in the food. The burger was poisoned, so it was a lethal burger, just like our hungry friend here. However, nothing about hungry burger implies poison, it just implies hunger, and teeth, and warrior for some reason. I would have expected fiend, though the monster stuffed animal was also a warrior, so maybe Yu-Gi-Oh just didn't have the typing for the whole harmless item with sharp teeth sorted out until they had frightmares. Anyway, how are you eating this guy, negative? X. Where do you even start with this guy? He's quick. We know he's murdered. He knows that I want to eat him, and he's waiting for it. I'm assuming he's like an alligator. Close of his mouth, he's got very little strength to open it up. And then I'll start domin. The hunter becomes the hunted. That's scary. Can you imagine your food trying to eat you? Yeah. Has that happened to you? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Back to Mokuba, though. It seems Hungry Burger has retroactively become a reference to his Poison Burger, where he has Hungry Burger as one of his signature monsters in Duel Links. So if it wasn't a reference initially, it is now. What I've always liked about Hungry Burger was its creativity with the ritual format. The visual point of a ritual monster is the spell that summons the monster shows the event that brings that monster to life, like a ceremony or prayer. For Hungry Burger, its ritual spell literally shows a chef cooking a burger very intensely. Look at that dramatic angle. Some people have questioned if this guy is related to the Bistro Butcher, who's another food-related monster. I don't think they're the same person, but Bistro Butcher looks like he works at the same deli where they would serve the Hungry Burger. I like how Bistro Butcher's Japanese name was Devil Chef, outright saying, yeah, the chef's from the underworld, but the localized name is like, no, don't worry, he's just a normal chef, nothing is off about him. I hope Hungry Burger isn't his pet, because I'd feel really bad about eating him, I mean, not bad enough to stop, but he's got stars on his head, I didn't even notice that. Is that his Bistro's rating? Two stars? You don't brag about that. Although I get the two star rating you got one guy here's like man everything was great delicious and then you got a like three one star reviews like man i got a segment of arm in my salad again i don't know why i keep coming back here bistro butcher was always interesting to me since he had a drawback for being an early 1800 attack level 4 monster giving your opponent a free draw too whenever he inflicts battle damage but he was released in the same set that had seven colored fish who was an 1800 attack level 4 monster with no drawback same rarity too, so Butcher was obsolete and outmatched on release. But hey, with that cleaver sword thing, at least Bistro Butcher could serve up seven colored fish for dinner. Number four, Papa Corn and Black Ship of Corn. There are a few corn-based monsters in Yu-Gi-Oh, but these two feel like the most prominent. The cuter one is Papa Corn, who capitalizes on his pun name by standing there proudly with his son, who's a kernel of corn. He may one day even pop into popcorn to make the pun even greater. Papa Corn's only effect is he gets 1,000 attacks points if you have a field spell up. So, I don't know, it synergizes with your Black Garden deck? Papa Corn mainly exists to be the mascot of your deck. The other major corn card is number 50, Black Ship of Corn. Solid effect. It sends your opponent's monster to the graveyard and inflicts damage for it. It doesn't destroy technically, so you may even avoid triggering some destruction effects your opponent has. But let's not gloss over the fact that this is a ship made of corn. I initially thought 
the of corn in its name was just part of some weird title that it had, and that was a unique wooden texture on the boat. But then I noticed, oh, that really is corn on the cob. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure corn is the best way to make a ship, but these guys seem to be doing it. I love this because if they just called this the black ship, you wouldn't know it's made of corn. Out of context, people would be like, oh, that's an interesting tile pattern. No one'd be like, is that corn? Now you might be thinking, what's Yu-Gi-Oh's fixation on corn? Well, I can't really explain why, but I do know their incentive for making as many corn cards as they did. The user of these cards in the Zexo manga was a pirate made of corn called Captain Corn. We briefly mentioned it in the honorable mentions of my Weird Xyz video, but this guy explodes into popcorn when he's defeated, and he speaks in corn puns. How can I not love him? So he was undefeated up until that point? I mean, he must have been, because if not, there'd be a lot more popcorn around. His other cards include Corn Parade, Crack Corn, Corn Fused, and In Corn Seavable. Konami is ready to have corn be a real life archetype here. They just need to pull the trigger. Captain Corn is as crazy of a character as he sounds. He's a real ear of corn that was eaten by a pirate in the 18th century. A single kernel from it got stuck in the pirate's compass. When the compass was found in the modern day, plot points aligned where the pirate was unintentionally revived as a human-sized ear of corn when the kernel fell out of the compass and into the villain's machine. And now the corn pirate works for a theme park. He's basically looked in the mirror. He's like, you know what? Everyone's always going to think of me of corn. So I'm not gonna learn a new hobby. I'm gonna give them exactly what they expect. All corn, all the time. What's that? The black ship? No, it's a black ship of corn. Put that in the microwave, it's gonna pop! And here I thought the tomato farmer was going to be the funniest food-based duelist in Zexel, but I don't think you could top the absurdity of this captain's cavalcade of corn. Number 3, Mystic Tomato. We discussed Mystic Tomato on our censored card list, where we were perplexed that they would so drastically change the design from a jack-o'-lantern face to the face of a murderer, but thanks to the comments on that video, we've speculated that it might have been done to avoid copyright issues. Mystic Tomato's Japanese name is Killer Tomato, likely in reference to the movie and cartoon series Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. The Japanese design might have looked too similar to the series, so they wanted to adjust it for international releases. Though I think the new design still looks similar to the Killer Tomatoes too, so it's just speculation, nothing's confirmed. The point is, now we can have debates on which tomato design is better. The American version is a lot more horrifying. Like, oh my god, it looks like he wants to tell me a secret. But like, the secret is when and how I'm gonna die. I'm, not, I'm gonna be honest here, I'm not eating this guy. I'm hurling him as far away from me as possible. Oh, you know what? This also looks like that killer puppet thing from JoJo's. Why does he have such big veins in his head? He's just so intense. The Japanese version is so much better. It looks like a little jack-o'-lantern. Mystic Tomato was actually one of the most used cards on this list, especially in the early days of Yu-Gi-Oh, since he was one of the attribute recruiters released in the Magic Ruler set. When these recruiters were destroyed by battle, they could summon another monster with the same attribute as them from the deck with 1500 or less attack points in attack position. I feel like half of the designs made sense for their attribute and half were weird picks. Shining Angel for Light, Giant Rat for Earth, and Flying Kamikiri for Wind all fit the type of monsters with those attributes generally. But then they chose Mother Grizzly for water, UFO Turtle for fire, and Mystic Tomato for dark. At least with the first two, I could think of an explanation for the design. For Mother Grizzly, I guess bears are good swimmers, even though the three water-centric types also had monsters that were good swimmers. Then they actually chose an aquatic animal for fire, but they could get away with it since he was a machine and many machines were fire attribute early on. Though, for Mystic Tomato, I can't think of a good explanation on why they specifically chose a tomato to be the dark recruiter, so I'm just assuming that they had his design lying around and thought, this dude is scary, there's no way he's not evil. Make him the dark recruiter. Regardless, this plant-based demon was a familiar face to players throughout the early formats, thanks to his widespread synergy with all the dark and chaos decks and his high potassium content. Number two, the 
Dolce archetype. Just all of them. They're all great. But Dolce is an archetype composed of chibi royal doll cute character things who are all themed around French or Italian desserts. The people and animals still appear to be people and animals, but they wear or stand on a platform made of the dessert they represent. You don't want to eat these monsters without checking on what's food and what's not. Though, I don't know how much you would want to eat these pastries regardless knowing where they've been. Who wants to eat a tiramisu that this queen has been sitting on all day? The hoot cakes have baby owls in them. There's probably owl pellets in there. However, I will take that pancake on his head. Would that hurt him if I took it off or is that just an accessory? The ant jelly looks okay to touch, since that angel is floating above the jelly, so we don't have to worry about her feet contaminating the food. My favorite one might be the pudding sass, since she gets an upgrade where she has an alamode form. Look how proud she is of her new dress. Also, big pile of flan. And the marmal maid is sitting on a jar of marmalade. I was so distracted by that delicious looking cookie sandwich that I didn't even notice her seat pun. A major food related thing about the medulce, besides the pastry that they stand on are their backgrounds. They assault us with other sweets. There's cakes and cookies and even a pretzel coming at me. The sheer amount of dessert options that Medulce gives me is overwhelming. I feel like that Sabrina pancake meme. Guys, help me out in picking who's the most delectable Medulce. Oh my god, these are all too friendly. It's just a little puppy. Oh, I hate these food-based cards because I can't eat them without feeling like a monster. What about the hoot cakes? I said I would eat part of him. I can't eat an owl either. I'm not a monster. And he's got his children in front of him. Maybe the Bapple? That looks like it's mostly made of food. Oh, it's like a little cow. It's a sheep. It's too cute to eat. Alright, Mr. Top Dennis. I'm no longer gonna eat all the cards here. I can't do it. The Medulches win. Maybe we can just settle on eating their palace. That thing looks delicious. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm eating. I'm eating their whole city. I don't know who that person is. The greeter? Like, welcome to our city? Oh, you'll regret saying those words. Let me just tuck in here and yum yum. Yeah. Do you guys supply the knife and fork, or do I have to bring my own? I shouldn't ask. I brought my own anyways. Honorable Mentions, World Carrot Weight Champion. The effect is good for plant decks, but that name. Are there other carrot fighters? Is there a sports league of vegetable people that we don't know about? What's a carrot weight? This is actually the localized name, with his Japanese name just being Carrot Man. But even that's weird, since they're giving him this generic name as if he's a standard carrot guy with arms and legs in the vein of Mushroom Man with nothing special. But no, this guy has a championship belt! You can't just brush that away as if he's just some inconspicuous carrot man with no major backstory. You gotta give him a flashy name. <laughs> that's funny. My rabbit would eat it. What is the weight of a carrot weight class? It goes fly weight, carrot weight, squash weight, melon weight, um, cow weight. I'm trying to think of food right now. Marshmallow. You can tell me that he's made of pure marshmallow, but I'm not sure if I believe leave you looking at those teeth. Same goes for you, Marsh Macaroon. I like his glasses too. They help defuse the situation against Yami Bakura by putting these glasses that you'd find at a joke shop on his very serious monster. Sylvan Peacekeeper. First, great pun. Second, I like your megaphone made of a flower. He's like, I'm calling all of you. We're coming down hard. Potato and Chips. This was a promo card released in a bag of chips that struck a deal with Yu-Gi-Oh! in Japan. I'm not sure if they're actually potatoes or if they just look like them, but if they are potatoes, that's pretty dark that they would just eat chips so nonchalantly. And Curry Fiend. He only exists in the anime, so go watch that episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. I love those goofy one-off duels. For number one, we chose the Yu-Gi-Oh! food that came out after all the monsters that we've discussed discussed, showing how far the Yu-Gi-Oh foods have evolved and gotten even more creative. Number 1, the Gunkin Suship Archetype. As that name implies, this archetype entails Gunkin Sushi, being the standard seaweed wrapped around rice sushi, combined with battleships, to go with the term Gunkin also meaning battleship in Japanese. So as random as it seems that they would choose these big ships to be themed around sushi, it was fitting wordplay all along. The whole archetype revolves 
revolves around summoning monsters, which are the ingredients for sushi, and then using those monsters as materials for an XC summon of the full dish of sushi, with a fun boat flavor. To take the gag even further, the monster that starts off all your combos to get your other food monsters on the board is Gunkin Suship Shari, which is Japanese for rice. It's rice, but really big, instead of teeny like it usually is. Well, if you want tiny rice, just go ask Shimoji Soldier. Rice is the key ingredient for all sushi, so it makes sense that you cannot build your sushi ship without it. And it's a normal monster, going with how rice is plain on its own. Plus, we get the lore drop of the century on this sushi ship card. Normally, I'd read the lore out loud, but that's a lot of text, so... Okay, fine, I'll read it. Finally got to visit that harbor specializing in the gunk and sushi ships that I've been curious about. The premium Shari here is limited to 200 sushi ships a year, and uses specially developed smooth-aged rice, giving it an extra boldness not found anywhere else. The classy atmosphere made my heart sing too. The scozo beb bleh, okay, well, that's as far as I'm getting with that lore. Back to the entry. The first of the other ingredients is the uni sushi ship monster, which is urchin, being loaded onto the rice to create a new dish. And if you reveal a shari in your hand to special summon the uni, then you can special summon the shari too, since you need both ingredients to cook. Similarly, the ikura monster represents the fish eggs, and if you have the rice on the field, you can special summon the ikura sushi ship. Same goes for the Ice Fish Sushi Ship card. So with the main deck Sushi Ship Monsters, if you got rice, the other ingredients will soon follow. Once you have your level 4s on the field, it's time to get building. Depending on which of the three non-rice cards you have, you get to build a full-size Sushi Ship version of the corresponding dish, and the artwork is stunning on all of them. And to play on the battleship part of their design, depending upon which ingredient you detach from the Xyz monster, you can activate a unique effect on the Xyz monster as if you're firing the material as ammunition, like detaching the Ikari on the Ikari ship and you get a second attack. Then you get to swarm the field with other Su ships, making these waters dangerous for your opponent. The Xyz monsters technically don't need the specific ingredients to be summoned, so if you want to make your sushi out of photons, go ahead, but it won't do anything after that. To add to the visual gag, on the non-rice cards, you see the ingredients being loaded on as cargo, being a clever way to emulate a shipyard. And their field spell is a loading dock slash restaurant. Also, their trap card is a menu. Love that. Overall, the sushi ships took the mechanic of XC summoning and made it emulate sushi prep to the best of their ability. It's a concept that's both strange and fascinating, so they deserve to be the top Yu-Gi-Oh food monsters who just so happen to be weird. Now, what did you think? Who are your favorite Yu-Gi-Oh foods, whether they were on this list or not? Would you snack on these guys, or do they need a little more time in the oven? Let us know in the comments. Anyway, thank you all for watching, and we will see you in the next video.